definitely occurs. It's just rarer. And what's really great about RESTful is it's predictable. So here we have a create endpoint. So create endpoints will always have the post verb and then always be the URL um, of the resource name, right? So it doesn't have to be post. It could be anything. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. If we want to read, we then get an ID. If we want to read everything in um, a specific resource, like every resource, we could just do get posts. And that would kind of do a read all. We have update. So update is a bit strange. So the put and also down here for delete, um, they are like very rare to see properly implemented in the web. Mobile, you seem to find it. Web, not so much. Um, so you might also find these kind of weird structures here. And that's just to use the put rather than the post verb. And that's it. According to the kind of the specification for RESTful, this is the correct way of doing things. So if you're not sure, look for this and then look for all the other ones. Um, yeah, sometimes you find edit, sometimes you find delete. Um, so like we tend to find these like custom ways of doing things. Um, but we're going to talk more about that today because while there is this kind of structure for RESTful APIs, Everyone ignores it. There's like there's this like perfect, lovely specification that nobody follows. Um, because when developers actually make software, they take shortcuts. And those shortcuts are often time saving, they're often really useful for getting products out on time, but they don't make for secure software. So what we tend to find is like um these RESTful endpoints are like half implemented. So let's just summarize this. So APIs are used to power many types of apps, not just like one specific type. We're in this webinar only gonna be focusing on RESTful APIs because they're some of the most challenging to enumerate. And we're gonna be reading JSON a lot. So if you're not really comfortable with reading JSON, don't worry, I'm gonna take you through it quite um, slowly. But apart from that, don't worry about it. So what is it? What are our goals? What is our methods, destination? Why do we need to do it? One of the kind of um, themes that keeps on coming up when we talk about reconnaissance is this idea of just try and find everything. Just try and find everything doesn't really work in practice when we're actually doing any kind of security assessment or penetration test um, because, like, life doesn't work out that way. You can't just like mass scan somebody's poor website and hope you find something. We need to look at doing this focus and actually trying to figure out what we're trying to achieve. So our goal is what we actually want out of this. Like, what do we want out of this recon? Are we trying to find new endpoints? Are we trying to find um, new parameters? the method, so what tools and techniques we can use to do it, and the destination, what our output is, and how we're actually going to use that output. A lot of people don't realize that you kind of have this last stage of like, okay, you've got all this data, what are you going to do next with it? And it gets forgotten a lot when people talk about, especially reconnaissance activity, that we actually need to provide to any kind of like client when we're doing a security assessment, here's a bunch of stuff you should check out. And if we're saving it in really random places, we can't do that. So what's the goal of API enumeration? So primarily what we're trying to do is increase our attack surface. So our attack surface means like things we know we can hack. So if you're on the blue team and you already have a big list of APIs, that's great, that's perfect. But if you don't, this is where attack surface mapping really becomes challenging. And especially even for developers, because you know what? People make API endpoints, use them once, and then completely forget they exist. So where does that leave us? Well, we want to find those endpoints that wouldn't normally be available. Like we might be able to read the documentation. We might be able to read something like um, open API specifications. But there's going to be something forgotten in there. And that's what we're really trying to solve with this. 
Another thing we might look for is like endpoints that require a specific set of actions. So if we're looking at, say, making an order, you know, we have to pick a product, then we have to go to the checkout, then we might have to go to some billing website, then we're going to have to go somewhere else and over here. And by that point, you know, is there an easy way to just get to the end? Like, can you just put in a bunch of expensive stuff into the cart and then not pay for it? And really what we're trying to do is a treasure map. We just want to list everything we can so we know what to look at and therefore we know what to look for. So it, it's our treasure map. It, it's the it's our going to be our guide throughout this process. So how are we going to do it? So we know that there's kind of two um, uh, assumptions we can make. We know that if users exist, we might expect something like posts to exist, depending on what the application is. So, you know, for something like a forum, we might expect posts. We might expect something like um, replies. We might expect something like um, uh, avatars. We might expect something like votes. You know, we can start to make these assumptions about what we think might be there, but actually what is actually there. So we make this assumption. We know if this exists, then we think this, where post is equal to any of these that we want to check, also exists or might also exist. You know, it's going to really depend on our target to figure out, you know, whether or not that exists. Um, and then our second thing from this is we want to know what parameters it takes. Now, this is one of the most challenging things because parameters are not standardized like at all. They are so dependent on the API, on the company. You know, is the company somewhat older? You might expect, you know, to use camel, uh, sorry, snake case. So we see something like this for all of the um, names. Is it something newer? In which case you might see kind of camel case. Is it gonna be completely kind of um, like, uh, in lowercase, and that's just case problems, right? There is so many other other things. Like, how do we know that in post it's called a title or a description? What if it's called a body and a header? What if it's called um, uh, uh, a title and then a body? What if it's called something completely different? We just don't know. We don't know what terms are using. We don't know what's in that kind of vocabulary, this is a huge problem for us. So let's talk about approaches here. So if you're on the blue team, you might consider using traceable stuff because traceable will do this for you. Um, we aren't though, and we have to do this um, manually. So we use two kind of approaches. The first is automated tools. So for this, we're basically brute forcing. We're not brute forcing for something like passwords. We're brute forcing to find those resource names. Um, so with that, we need a list of words to try. And again, we're going to need this like tight word list. Like, how do we know what to try? Um, we also might want to look at tools designed to find parameters. So we know, need not just a word list for resource names, but a word list for parameters. We might need even custom software to, you know, if we get JSON back, maybe we want to try and pass that JSON and then feed it in. Um, for example, if we have a kind of, you know, get, get your user details and it returns email address, password, avatar, username, first name, last name, uh, we might want to feed all of those back in and see whether or not, you know, we can change our password without having that kind of password confirmation. We might want to see whether or not you can change somebody else's email address so you can reset the password on their behalf with your email address. Um, and to do that, there is there is kind of three tools I'm going to recommend. Um, first is Burp Intruder. The second one is FFUF, which stands for Fuzz Faster You Fool and another tool called Arjun. Um, so Arjun is very community focused, so is FFUF. Um, but Burp Intruder, you have to pay for it's part of Burp. So the next step is really to look at manual testing. Like there is no way to just 
automate yourself out of doing this properly. Um, we want to see and look, you know, what the website actually makes public. Like, does it actually make the documentation public? Does it provide developer documentation? We can also just poke at it. We can start to make some educated guess guesses. If we're on a forum, we might just try reply already. We might just try, you know, if we're looking at, um, you know, something like Reddit, even though it has its own kind of nomenclature with like upvotes, we might be able to assume as somebody looking at it, actually, we could try putting the word upvote in. So I'm really going to focus today on documentation because documentation is the most powerful thing. In fact, I saw today that somebody said um, well-written developer documentation is a uh, 100 times more useful than any course. And I completely agree with it. Developer documentation is so useful and not just for developers. <laughs> so let's have a chat about these tools. So Burp Intruder is this really simple to use brute forcing tool. I'll show you how to use it. FFUF is written in Go. So Burp Intruder is really powerful on its own, but you have to pay for its more powerful features. FFUF provides a nice alternative. It's a little bit more complex to get started. It does all, all like running the command line. And one of my favorite features is actually when you find something successfully, you can resend it to Burp and it will just like appear in there. So if your workflow is very Burp based, you can still use other tools like FFUF. It's great. And then my final one is Arjun. So Arjun is very good at finding new parameters. It's got some really great, um, like, quick checks it can do for parameters. Um, and it makes it so much easier just to discover new parameters. It's a really great piece of software. Okay, so what's our destination? We want really for the end goal to be a list of URLs. We want to load it up into Burp go through the list of bugs we've got and see whether or not they're vulnerable to certain like attacks. We then want to be able to present something that says, okay, this is vulnerable to this, it's vulnerable to this, it's then vulnerable to that. This API point is actually not vulnerable to anything. Good job. Um, our goal is essentially a list and we just want to check it off. We just want to go, yep, 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 no, yep. No, no, no. And that way we can present to the client, you know, look, this one was fine, but this top one, you know, it had issues. Uh, and we also might want to check for whether or not it returns sensitive data. Now, depending on what you consider sensitive is actually based on where you live, because legislation like GDPR is uh, only applies if you're storing data from European Union citizens. Um, though there are more recent um, kind of legislation, for example, in California, which is then protects personal data. So that's a really important to consider. OK, so what happens after? Um, so once you've done that, you can then just go through and hack them. Uh, just keep an eye out for anything that returns a lot of info, any IDs, any signs of like something internal that you can find. You know, APIs we often consider as being quite external, but actually there's a ton of things that just run internally that they've gone, yeah, it's internal, so we don't need to worry about it. It doesn't need to go through a security audit. Uh, any kind of reflected input, you know, we're talking about API vulnerabilities, but, you know, we've got to check for the usual suspects, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, um, these are kind of classic bugs that APIs are also vulnerable to. So let's actually get started. So our first steps. So the first thing to realize is that our structure varies. So uh, while RESTful does have this kind of structure, most APIs don't follow it, specifically with put and delete. They're going to be custom. So what it's really useful to do is to try and figure out the API structure before you even start the recon process. And what does that mean? Well, you have to tailor your approach. The first thing to, to like assess with an API before you even jump in is the API structure. What do the endpoints look like? Like, how does it work? How is it um, built? Like, how are people actually using it? So how do we actually do that? Well, step one is to just hit the app manually. 
gather some API endpoints. I mean, this one is a classic API endpoint, right? It's get API, like it's literally slash API. Um, so very clear resource name. And we know from this, and if we were to go down here, it, it would then, if we scroll down, it would then show us this obviously is our read for the resource name users. Like it's it's just like 100% like the one. So what part is the resource name? Well, for this one, it's really obvious. It's users. For some APIs, it might not be that obvious. But what we're really looking for is what changes between API requests. You know, is there API v1 versus v2? That's super useful information to know um, because that's stuff we want to enumerate. Uh, we then want to figure out what we kind of um, resources exist, what endpoints exist for each resource. We're just trying to better understand the entire way it, it's built and used. Um, like, at the end of the day, we're not hacking random API endpoints. We're actually usually doing an assessment of, you know, the product functionality. So you should know what these do. Like, this one reads users. Like, we want to know specifically, okay, what does that one do? Well, that one creates users, but that's not an API endpoint. What if it's like slash register? You know, it, it's making those kind of assessments. So this is one of the most important first steps we can make. Without doing this, we actually don't have anything to hack apart from, like, a domain. We can't just assume what's there. We need to know for sure, or there's really no point doing it. We also need to know how the API works. What endpoints for what resource? What do they do? Um, what impact can we actually create? So one of my favorite stories is about one of, one of my favorite bugs, which was an API bug. Um, and it was a very, very simple bug. You could just change a number. Like, that's not that interesting. The important thing here is that you could change the number of a runway length. Now, if you didn't know, you can't land big aeroplanes on small runways. They can't stop in time. Um, so you need to have that specifically built runways. And I was able to change a runway length. Now, while that's a really simple technical bug, like it's just a classic bowler or idle vulnerability, you could do something without having the right um, like permissions to do it. Actually, for like the impact that had, that was way bigger than just, um, you know, a simple bug. Like that's something which could endanger actual humans. So easy API recon, aka read the docs. The easiest way to get API uh, information out of API, just ask. APIs are sometimes, if not usually, designed to be used by external developers. So what that means is that, you know, something like Twitter or Facebook will just have the documentation written out for you. Like this one, you know, it says, here's the API endpoint, here's what it can respond to, here's the content type, um, here's what it returns, here's the type of everything it returns, Here's an explanation of what that means. And this is really useful for developers who are making applications. But for security testing, this is gold. Like, this is one of the most important ways of uh, actually testing something. So this includes things like every endpoint and the parameters you need, an example request, an example response. So you can not only do it this way, you can compare it to what it should be. So very easy security testing. And so this one here you can see is an example um, request and response. I'm just gonna erase the slides, yeah. So here you can see, you know, okay, how do I actually send a, a um, like message here? We can see what the data is. So this is the body of the HTTP request. And we can also see example response. That's so useful when you're, um, testing APIs like this, because it tells you what's normal. It tells you all of the parameters. It tells you 
all of the endpoints, it takes the guesswork out of things. And here are some examples. So Twitter, Facebook, Yahoo, all have these kinds of API documents and plenty of smaller targets who work with developers will also have API documentation. Like this is not something that is like completely new. Um, so where does that leave us? Well, there's also something called Swagger. So Swagger is a visualization tool for APIs. It's mainly used internally. Um, and that's because it's just really good at visualizing things. However, they're quite often left and sent to, um, uh, production. Now, this is not always a vulnerability in itself. This is usually perfectly fine to actually like put on the web. It, it's okay. However, again, it gives us so much information here. Um, it's another form of documentation. You know, we have, this is the pet ID. We have additional metadata. We have file. We can even send requests in the actual interface. It's so useful. And usually you find it at this endpoint. So that is underscore, underscore, not like a weird double underscore swagger. Um, so how do you hack it? Once you read the docs, you test every API endpoint. And this will be a really common theme. Very, a lot of API testing is trying everything. And especially if you're doing security assessments, it's almost always try everything, test every endpoint, what's vulnerable, not what's not vulnerable. It's more, it's still creative, but it's creative in a very different way. Um, and we're really looking for the top 10 books. And again, I'm gonna go over methodology in my next webinar where I'll go in, in way more detail about how you actually look for these and what every of the, like the API top 10 is. Um, but you hit the endpoints, you see what comes out. Is it what you're supposed to come out? Well, you have the documentation to check. You can also test for additional parameters not mentioned in the docs. So just because it says additional metadata file doesn't mean it actually won't accept other types. And in the case of kind of mass assignment, um, the API documentation might just say, oh yeah, that just returns someone's you know, email address. But actually, if you send the email address and password, it will also change the password. It just won't be in the documentation. So one thing to note here is API structure. So when we, when we talk about this, what we're really saying is that you need to be adaptable and change your approach. And one of the easiest ways you do that is word lists. So what are the good API word lists? And what's a method for actually creating your own? Because again, you have to be adaptable. You have to change. So what is a word list? A list of words. Um, <laughs> there's many different types of word lists though. So the way these are usually co collected is basically going through a ton of data. Um, so in this case, there's a this um, uh, uh, GitHub repository called API word list which has things like API seen in the wild. So is that one relevant? Maybe, maybe not. Is that going to be fact specific? Actions and objects. These are some of the best word lists. Um, having verbs and nouns, always really useful to check, you know, check the um, plural version and the singular. Um, actions all in uppercase, actions all in lowercase. Objects all in uppercase, objects all in lowercase. It's actually very common um, that people will kind of not do it for security reasons, but the, the, the words won't look right because of a developer decision to use a specific like format. Um, so all we really do here is the word list replace, you know, that resource name, because what we're trying to do is find more resources. But really, you should be making your own because APIs are incredibly specific to whoever's using them. Um, like I'm talking, you probably won't find the same endpoint in more than a few targets. Um, so when do we actually use word lists? Well, we use them two times. First, to enumerate resources and second, to enumerate parameters. These require two different word lists, to be clear. This is not something where you can run the same thing. 
because if you think about um, what we're looking for, if we're looking at resource names, we're looking for user, post, replies, um, avatars, you know, maybe they have like a chat room. Um, so we might be looking for chats as well. In addition, when we look at the parameters, a user will have the parameter of email, name, password. They're very different types of um, word lists that we end up using. And here's what they look like. So here's an example of two here. You can see on one side we have accelerate, acquire, activate, adapt, adjust, admin, alert. On the other side, you have account, accounts, amount, balance, balances. Again, making sure we don't just get the singular, but also the plural as well. And you know what? There's tons of these that are public. Uh, FuzzDB, um, Seclis have some. There's also the raft words as well, which kind of create these um, custom, uh, sorry, these these just common English words. I really like the Nahamsek method. Not going to talk too much on it, but essentially what he uses is BigQuery, and he uses that to generate target-specific word lists. But it's really, really good, especially for APIs. Tom Nom Nom made a follow-on talk to this. Same kind of idea. It's using the data, but instead the data of like what's in the web page. Um, and that's how you can kind of create them semi-automatically. Now, when we talk about this, we're also going to end up as being kind of manual word lists. Informed is probably a better term. So if you know a similar service, one of their competitors, maybe they have documented API, check those. Wayback Machine to see if there was documentation or what the website used to look like. Make sure you've tried the good old press all the buttons. You know, this pen testing is often a lot of just press all the buttons and see what comes out. Then start writing sensible words. You know, what does it say? This says create new post. Instantly, we're thinking, okay, post we've got to check for. We see my account. So maybe we're looking for accounts. We see um, community here. So maybe we should look for community. We're seeing learn. Like we're seeing up here, um, my feed, most votes, most active. So we're looking at feed, votes, active. Um, we're looking for answer. Like we can kind of assume from this one screenshot, a bunch of API endpoints. You know, what does the app say? What actions does it let you do? You know, we can also see icons here. We've got tags. We've got, you know, what happens if you press the three buttons? Um, we've got a search bar. You know, is that using the API? So it's really sometimes a lot of a lot of the time looking at these and then also kind of doing sensible things like uh, checking for synonyms. I have a script that literally just returns synonyms of words very, very useful. So how do we actually do it? So let's talk about FFUF and Burp Intruder. So FFUF, it's a tool written in Go that allows you to enumerate endpoints. Very straightforward. It's quicker than Burp Intruder, especially if you're doing it on um, the free version, and it's not that much more difficult to use. So let's have a look. So this is FFUF. So first argument we have is dash W and then the word list we're going to be using. So this is like before the raft words are API specific word lists. U for URL. And then we've got a URL in here. Now FFUF will replace the fuzz here. So wherever you write fuzz, it will replace. Including in um, requests as well. You can set this up to get parameters to change headers, to um, you know do this kind of more traditional API hacking stuff. It's so useful. The output, um, but also then this lovely parameter called X. And that says everything that works goes to burp. So we can continue using that burp-centric um, workflow, but still take advantage of the power of FFUF. It's fantastic. So we found a bunch of API endpoints. What's next? Well, what data goes in? <laughs> like we've got API version one users, but we don't know what we can do with it. Um, we want to take what find out what parameters it can take, so we can decide where to hack it. I really like the tool Arjun because it does a ton of this um, on your own. 
like on its own so you don't have to worry about it you just send it what you've got and it will figure it out um and it's great so let's have a look at what that looks like so it runs on python so this part is the python part so that's in gray so you for url so again we just send it um what we're looking at so in this case it is uh kind of the same api endpoint but we're not using uh, fuzz we're using just users on its own because it's going to figure it out um we tell it what it's going to do so we want to check for a post request on this one you know we want to find out what we can post to it what the data is going to be in so in this case json and i made a fork that also does the same with the x parameter um this is on github if you want to have a look at it so advantages we can just keep sending it URLs from our recon process and just let it run. We can save it to a file, come back to it. It's quick. Um, the downside is that it's kind of limited in what HTTP methods it can do. It can only do get and um, uh, post at the moment. But sometimes we get lucky and find this. So this is often, um, sorry, my doorbell just went. Um, often when we kind of do web hacking in particular, we can only do get. And, or we can only do post requests. But this method parameter exists sometimes in APIs, which just allows you to set what um, uh, whether or not to use put or delete. It's great. So what happens next? Well, we can analyze the results. So this was run in Docker, which is why it looks a bit odd. So here we can see um, we've got this method parameter, so that's great. But we're also able to extract email, name, password. Um, so we know that for an individual user here, we can't do very much, which is fine. We knew that, right? Because we know that should be just a read functionality. If we're going to the main um, API here, we know that we should be able to post to create. We should be able to delete in some way. We should be able to put in some way. And we like we should be able to make all these assumptions. If we then start to include this one, so this is a way of um, adding a um, argument in the tool itself. We can assign that method put, and then this tells us what we can change. So we can see from these two that when we create a user, we have access to password. We don't have access here. So this API endpoint can't be used to change someone's password. And this is what we end up with. We end up with this big list of URLs and a way, at least on our end, for looking through them and trying to understand what they mean. Um, easy ways like, you know, turning idols or BOLAs or BOLAs into account takeovers. You know, we can change an email address here. We can't change a password. But if we change the email address to just be our email, right, we can just reset it. And then we've got control over the account. Easy way to increase that severity. And um, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me. And very much thank you to your Traceable for hosting me today. Uh, here's how you can contact me. Here is my Twitter and LinkedIn. Feel free to um, come chat with me. Uh, I'd happily take any questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, lots of great information there. Uh, we hope that this detail will help security leaders and developers better understand the risks that their APIs can pose uh, and if their APIs are not created and handled correctly. Uh, we did have some technical difficulty in the beginning of the session, uh, but uh, rest assured the full presentation will be posted to Bright Talk for replay, and we apologize for that. Uh, with that, we'll move on to Q&A. Um, and let me just check the uh, what we got here. OK, so um, Katie, uh, someone says, I'm excited to try these things that you've showed us. How do I avoid getting in trouble? Good question. So easy way is to get permission. You know, you can launch like um, APIs that are vulnerable yourself. I've written a thing called Generic uh, University, which is available on GitHub. Um, you can just Google Generic University. It will come up. Um, there are other vulnerable APIs. So the OWASP API team have had um, Crappy, so that's C, R, and then API, um, which is a vulnerable API. 
uh, you can experiment with. If you want to try it on like a real target, you can of course sign up to a bug bounty program. And what they really allow you to do is get that permission that you need to kind of explore this. Um, and I mentioned in my talk, uh, uh, Yahoo, which has a public bug bounty program, Twitter that does, and Facebook, they all have public bug bounty programs. Um, Facebook is hosted by them. It's called Facebook White Hack. Twitter is on Hacker One, and Yahoo is also on Hacker One as well. So if you want to experiment with any of those, you're covered as long as you're participating within the rules of the bug bounty program. Great information. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, lots of lots of opportunities out there to try this out safely in your own environment and uh, working uh, to help others as well. Um, fantastic. Uh, kind of somewhat related question. Isn't this data that you're teaching going to enable bad people to do bad things? Uh, bad people who do bad things are not watching <laughs> um, this kind of content. Uh, <laughs> The, the, they're not going to sit through a webinar, like an hour-long webinar on how to hack APIs, uh, not that kind of audience. Um, but of course, yeah, it totally will. I hope that developers and security people and students will flock to my videos instead, because at the end of the day, they make up the majority of you know people who will become security leaders in the future or already are who can use this information to actually make the web more secure, make APIs more secure, but really make us as we, especially as we transition at the moment, you know, we hear about um, breaches every single day. Like there is not a day that goes by where somebody hasn't been breached. I really hope that my work will enable those to become fewer and fewer, or at least require more technical expertise and be more interesting. We learn a lot from the here, here. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I think uh, um, I would summarize that as as uh, know know your own vulnerabilities before before somebody else does, right? And this this helps you to be able to do that. Yeah, for sure. And I think especially learning how to hack is really really powerful in that regard because developers will make mistakes. Like we can't expect developers to make secure software all the time. Um, it's just not realistic. It's it's not it's not realistic. It's not nice to the developers to make them feel like they're always on edge, um, but it, it it's not going to happen. So by teaching people how to hack and giving them those offensive skills, one, it's kind of fun to play the attacker. It's it's fun to be the bad guy, and to play the bad guy, and then find something you didn't know was there in the end. Indeed. Very good. Um, final question we have here. What do you do if you're working with more specialized APIs, like, uh, for example, non-RESTful APIs? Does this uh, also apply, what you've showed us? So it's really hard to approach those kinds of APIs. And I don't think there's anybody hacking APIs who will tell you it's easy. Um, my first thing I always do, especially when a company something really specialized, is I press all the buttons because you don't always need to look for like hidden functionality um, to actually be able to um, like find vulnerabilities in APIs. Often it's functionality that's just there. So it's finding, you know, how to change your account information. You know, especially we talk about something like the medical domain where things are very, very specialized. Um, it's finding things like, okay, we're not going to see patient in the medical domain. We're going to see, uh, sorry, we're not going to see user in the medical domain. We're going to see patient. We're not going to see, um, you know, we're going to see something like drugs, medication, but we might then also see really technical words. So it's in some ways becoming a bit of an expert in kind of a very broad sense of how language is used. Um, but also more broadly, it's about um, pressing the buttons and seeing what you can do with what comes out. At the end of the day, hitting all of the buttons will solve exactly the same issues as um, like not hitting all the buttons. Cool. Yeah, so I know um, that, for example, traceable. What it does is is uh, it it uses AI to to look at 
specialized and non-specialized APIs and, and look for anomalies in, in the use of them. Um, do you know if there are any uh, tools available to the hackers, so to say, that, that also are starting to use AI to do that? Um, not AI, but we are starting to see really large data sets. And I do hope that we start to see something like what Traceable is doing, because I, I just like, this is my genuine opinion. I have not been paid to say this. I genuinely think what Traceable does and, and how it works is amazing. Like it's incredible how it can map the attack surface. Um, and I wish there was something like that available for hackers. Like I would kill for it <laughs> because it would make my job so much easier. Um, but there's nothing really. However, we are starting to see larger data sets. Unfortunately, large data sets also mean a large amount of noise. So there's probably quite a lot of work to still be done there for sure. Very good. Well, and, and, and thank you for the uh, for the unsolicited uh, um, <laughs> appreciation. Um, great. So with that, uh, I want to uh, thank you once again, uh, Dr. Katie Paxton Fear, for this great set of information. Um, this concludes this webinar. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you will join us all again for the next in the series on June 29th, where Katie will be covering API hacking methodology. So once again, thank you for your time and attention. Have a good rest of your day or evening. Thank you, everybody.